I think most of us um, have several different roles or jobs. Um, uh, I'm a dad and a father. Um, I'm one of the breadwinners in a family of five. Um, and for over 30 years, I've been a family doctor in Newbridge, which is 50 kilometers outside of Dublin uh, in Ireland. During my time as a family doctor, it has struck me uh, that when people get diagnoses, I've got some myself, uh, some people do amazingly well with them. There's a bigger crowd in the middle who have a different kind of experience, some good, some bad. And some people have a really difficult time. And the same thing, it strikes me, is relevant in terms of how we approach our death. This is what I'd like to talk about, uh, because I think how we die really matters. Death, there's a lot of it around. Uh, in our practice, about five to 10 people die each year. It's not because we're bad doctors, it's just people die all the time. In Ireland, it's 33 to 35,000 people die. In the planet, uh, it's 53 to 55 million. And the experience varies enormously. If you're a Muslim man or a Muslim woman, you could die in a ditch uh, under persecution from the regime in Myanmar. Earlier this week, people were dying quietly of hypothermia in the forests of Central Europe. In Kildare, we're amazingly lucky. Birmingham, Alabama, Melbourne, we live long lives. We die predictably for the most part. Um, and with prospect of reasonable care at end of life. But it still doesn't always happen like that. 1961, she left him. She'd really had enough. It was my mother. Uh, the culture at that time uh, was a patriarchal theocracy. And she just found it stifling. She was a doctor, but she had to give that up. She got out. She went into an inner city practice uh, that she set up herself and worked really hard for 30 years. She was the most amazing mother. Um, I think I had the best mother in the world. He was good as well. They were victims of the culture that they were in. 1989, I got a call. One of these days, I'm not going to be here. I need to get my stuff sorted out and you're going to help me to do it, she said. So I did, as young men often do with their mothers, and I brushed her off, and I just couldn't actually imagine that it would ever happen to her, and how foolish was that, and me a doctor as well. But she came back and asked me a second time. Then I knew she was serious. And we were a typical Irish family of that generation, a family of four children. The other three had gone to Canada because things were so difficult. Uh, I was at home, so I rang Canada. Uh, she thinks she's going to die, and she wants me to sort out her stuff. I'm going to make a bags of it, and you're going to think I'm fiddling the will and everything. <laughs> Two days later, the instruction came back from Canada, do this thing. Uh, so I went to her house. Um, and because inner city practice doesn't, at the time, pay particularly well, she didn't have a lot of money. She was a fabulous collector of things. Um, and we spent two or three hours in her living room, and it was amazing. There was a lot of giggling. There was business transacted. Um, we reflected, it, it caused us to think back about all of her life. Uh, so I left, um, convinced I had the most wonderful mother in the world, and I felt that I knew her even better than I did before. It was really an affirming, affirmative experience for me, and it was of use to her. Uh, she had smoked a lot, uh, as women did in the 40s and 50s, so she knew it was probably going to be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or bronchitis or a stroke. And two to three years later, she had a stroke. And she was fortunate uh, in that my sister, uh, that man that she had left, uh, and myself were around her, and she disappeared to the sound of the five glorious mysteries, which was a, a great way for a mum uh, of her background and culture and belief to go. Twenty eleven. At the time, I was training uh, GPs, or, or young doctors had become GPs, and we were out in our training scheme out in Talla, and somebody came out to us from the Irish Hospice Foundation at the time, and they brought uh, that, Think Ahead, 
uh, with them. And they said, this is new, it has come out at the forum and end of life. And that was a great uh, event, really, in our Irish democratic process, where the government carried out a, a consultation exercise. The Hospice Foundation were central in administering that. They consulted, we asked people what did they want, what would they like. Uh, and one of the things was this, it's an end of life planning tool. And we thought, this looks really interesting. We could do something with this. So we took it into five of our teaching practices. Um, and the initial response was, so you want us to give this out, it's a booklet about everything that could happen and all the eventualities, it's a booklet about dying and you want us to give that to people. They're going to be very upset, they will come back to us, they'll want to talk for hours about all the ask. we couldn't possibly. But we did the studies and actually people found it hugely acceptable. They didn't come back uh, with a whole lot of queries or questions. They really made decisions. Over 86% of them uh, engaged in discussions within their family. This really works. Um, so increasingly in our practice we're beginning to get better at this. Um, ever since I left my mother's house back in 89, I did wonder who was actually talking to my frailer patients about their death and dying. Uh, the end of life planning tool uh, was a way uh, to move the conversations forward. In practice, Michael, not his real name, uh, aged 84, recent diagnosis of prostatic cancer. Um, and as increasingly we do, when his care path had been stabilized, suggested that he might take this out and have a look at it and come back in a couple of weeks and see what you make of it. And he came back, uh, a man who was born in hard times in this country, limited education, worked hard at a small job, um, was in possession of a small pension. How did you get on with that? It was all right, he said. Um, I think it's okay, but I don't want the machine switched off. I don't want the machine switched off. It took me about uh, 30 to 60 seconds to figure out that he didn't want the ventilator switched off because he understood that when the ventilator was switched off, um, his pension would stop. And his big thing in life was his lovely wife that he still loved madly. It took us about two minutes to actually scope out to him what would actually happen when he died. Uh, that there was uh, the fair deal, that the practice would be there to look after Mary um, and that she would be looked after. Uh, he left unburdened. Helen, um, who was having a really difficult time as a lady in her uh, middle 50s with an aggressive breast cancer. Um, as her care uh, became less effective and her care requirements escalated, there were house calls. It was a beautiful house to visit. Um, it was the kind of house call where you always got a, a bag of homemade fudge beautifully wrapped on your way out the door. And I made the assumption, this is just such a lovely house, I said, I presume you're going to want to be here um, uh, for, for the whole thing. My gosh, no, I don't. Um, and she had three adult children. And her perspective on it was that when she died, it was going to be a huge, big circus, and she wanted the house as a refuge for her children. So there are the small details, and there are certainly bigger details. 2015, I took a group of our fantastic uh, fourth-year GP trainees. We went to Amsterdam. It was themed around end of life. We went to the Rijksmuseum where we took in an exhibition in the morning of the older Rembrandts. Then we went to the Hogeve, uh, which is a fantastic facility for the community-based care of people with advanced dementia. And then to balance it all out, uh, we did a workshop uh, on medical assistance in dying. My crowd were fourth years, um, and uh, the people giving the workshop, there was a third year Dutch trainee uh, and a senior GP doctor. And of course, fourth years tend to look down on third years everywhere, that's just universal. She explained that she'd been involved in a case. It was a gay couple. Um, it was COPD, chronic obstructive airways disease, that one of the men um, escalating admissions, diminished quality of life, agonizing shortness of breath, um, and he really felt that life had become incredibly difficult. Um, these were gentlemen who were of a, of, a, of a good, of a great age indeed. She explained uh, that he raised the issue with her, that she raised it with her training doctor, uh, that they got an outside doctor from the practice to overview the case. And she was very pragmatic about it, uh, that they had all their friends to the social wake on the Wednesday and that the house call was set up for a Friday. And she explained that she went along to the house call, that the ambulance service arrived and put up an, an IV line. And of course she explained, I didn't need that to happen because I know how to do IV lines, but it was just another labor of service that was involved. The local police station was advised uh, that probably there would be a death in the neighborhood. And she said, I went and I administered the medication. And she described uh, that he died comfortably. 
uh, in his own bed, close to the man that he loved, with the doctor who knew, knew him. Um, so where does this leave us, really? Um, 2021, uh, here we are. Um, there is cultural change. Sometimes it happens so slowly you could actually miss it. Uh, but when we look all around the world behind us, we can see from Australia, from New Zealand, uh, we can see right across Europe, uh, Austria, Spain, Portugal, uh, right across uh, in Australia, five out of the seven states, in America, five of the American states, all of Canada switched on medical assistance in dying in 2015. Um, it is an issue for us. It's an issue for us in this country. Reflecting on the practice, what do we know about it? We know that in health systems where this has been running for quite a while, it appears to be relevant to about 10% of all people who are dying. And of that 10%, usually about 2 to 3% or 2 to 4% will actually avail of it. In Ireland, we have fabulous palliative care in many parts and in many communities, but not all. Um, but we understand that even with the best medical care, there will be a percentage of cases where there will be significant, serious suffering that's not amenable uh, to, to uh, symptom, uh, symptom management. So it's important, certainly, in that context. But looking at all of death, uh, what can we do? What can you do? Or what can I do um, about this? Pulling together from the evidence and from practice, maybe there are seven steps, seven steps that you might consider uh, towards having a good death for yourself. The first is to take control of your own death. It doesn't belong to the state. It doesn't belong to some nephew in Birmingham. It's your death. The second step, think about it a little and often. Uh, I do that most weeks. And as I get older, I do it a little bit more. And I find when I think uh, that I'm not going to be there at some stage in the future, it changes the way I turn up for people. I choose to do different things. Paradoxically, I, feel less, I, I act less selfishly. The third step, understand how it is that you're likely to die. Mammy knew that it was going to be probably COPD or a stroke. We can't always predict. But if you do engage with your doctors and ask the questions, you will get a feel. For example, in our kind of society, middle and high income countries, by the time most of us get to die, uh, one in three uh, or one in, one in four of us will have significant impaired cognitive function or dementia. So build that into your thinking. The fourth step, identify your trusted friend. Recruit them, somebody who knows you, that you can have deep conversations with about what's important for you and what you want as your time draws by. And be pragmatic about it. Um, you might divorce your trusted friend, so you need to get another one. And as we get older, uh, whereas you might have started off with your life partner as your trusted friend, later it might be one of your children or a younger friend. Identify your trusted friend. Get and use your end of life planning tool. They're everywhere. Uh, in Australia, uh, I think they have seven of them. Uh, in, in England and in Northern Ireland, they use your life, your decisions. Get one. Anybody over 50 should have it. Anybody who's got a life-limiting diagnosis should have it. it. Takes about 45 minutes or an hour to complete. Get a little help from your friends, especially your trusted friend, and do that thing. The sixth step. Practice the decision. I've had enough medical care. The performance psychologists tell us that people who are effective at complicated tasks generally imagine them. They imagine themselves being successful. And you have to rehearse this decision. I've had enough medical care. Um, when we look at the issue of medical assistance in dying, in all of the countries it's been brought in, it tends to shape up. Uh, the electorate generally make their mind up. They have a good idea about that. In polling in Ireland, for example, two-thirds of the electorate support the idea. The politicians sit in the middle, um, and they sit on the fence, particularly, uh, because in an electoral system, in a democracy such as ours, which is flawed, but I think probably better than most systems, the politicians sense a sensitivity uh, and don't want to alienate their older uh, electorate, who are the, particularly the ones who are likely to vote. Um, the doctors, uh, it's not a pretty discussion with the doctors. It's very important and serious for us. Um, but when we have the conversation with ourselves, 
you will have the two ends of the curve, the pro-medical assistance and the anti-medical assistance. You'll have the crowd in the middle who will be troubled uh, by an ethically sensitive and complex issue. It makes for a very difficult discussion. But it's not our decision. It's your decision. The seventh step, back to the performance psychologists. Do that thing. Imagine yourself having the best kind of death that you can. Patients, um, I'm profoundly grateful uh, the amount of trust they deliver, they provide, uh, and the examples that they provide. Um, I'd like to leave us with Emmett and Sandra. Several years ago, Emmett, uh, a man in what we used to call the prime of life, received a really difficult diagnosis of an aggressive malignancy. It was refractory to treatment, it didn't respond, and in a very short time, it was evident that he was becoming pre-terminal. It was several years ago. Uh, they didn't really have an opportunity to engage in all of the seven steps. But like many households, they were a fantastic family. They worked through as much of it as they could. From my perspective, as a family doctor, it was possible uh, for him to be at home and to be reasonably well supported. It was approaching Christmas a very important time uh, in most Irish households. And the tradition in the house was Christmas morning was the great morning. And the adult children came home. Um, and as it was the custom, uh, under the Christmas tree, the presents were opened. Um, and that was, that was the way it had been in that house for all the lives of these children. On that morning, uh, he made it down with some assistance. And he was on the couch. Uh, and everybody did what they always did. And the joy and the happiness and the warmth and the profound sadness. Sandra looked around, and he was gone. He went, maybe, with the sounds of the loved ones, the most dearest people in his life. It really was a good death. So, whose life, whose death is it? It's yours, it's mine. How we die really matters. And in family practice, we can see from generation to generation that how people die powerfully uh, impacts on the family that they leave behind. And it can be a negative, difficult, divisive impact. It can really be a positive, wonderful impact. It can be a real legacy. So whose death is it? It's yours. Um, make it the best that you can. Thank you for listening. <laughs>